welcome to the Box Angels Podcast with me, your host. Hello, I'm Mike Elder. It means a lot that you're here listening to the show, and if you're new, it means even more to me. We got to do a little housekeeping really quick. We got a few Patreon members since I did an episode of a few weeks ago. Sorry for the delay. I want to shout out Karima, Dan, and Oliva. Or Olivia? Fuck. It's probably Olivia. Karima, Dan, and Olivia. Thank you so much for being uh, subscribers on the Patreon. If you want a shout out, go subscribe to the Patreon. All the previous, like the first 300 episodes, all the audio is on there. So if you want to hear some of the old episodes, go take a look at the Patreon and support the show. The money doesn't mean much to me, but it helps. <laughs> oh my goodness. Wow. Also, go to the YouTube channel, click subscribe there. I want 100,000 subscribers on my YouTube. There's tons of video clips, full episodes, a lot of good stuff up there. Go over there and click subscribe. Like I said, it's been a few weeks since I did a new episode, so I apologize, but we're back. I'm excited. This was a really fun episode. This week, I'm talking to actor Sarah Tomko. Sarah's been on shows like Once Upon a Time, Sneaky Pete, The Leftovers, but she's known now for her series regular role on Resident Alien, which just got picked up for a fourth season. How exciting is that? We talked about that, though. The journey on that show has been long for her. They shot the pilot almost seven years ago, I think she said. And then there was, will it get picked up? Will it not? COVID, all this stuff. So it's been a journey for her and a really interesting breakthrough for her. Like, we talked about that. Is it good? Is it bad? You, you can't ride the up and down because you never know what's going to happen next, even if you book that series regular role. We talked about that. We talked about the struggle to stray, stay creative during the down times. We talked about journey from graduating with a BA in theater to finding regular work, working as a waitress, side hustles, and things like that. This was a really fun conversation. Sarah was so sweet. And this was her first in-person podcast. She had only done Zoom podcasts previously. So it was really fun to connect with her and uh, share that moment with her, which was great. I think you're going to dig this episode. So without further ado, I give you... Hi, I'm Sarah Tomko. Hi, Sarah. Hi. You can talk to me now. I'm so excited okay, great. to talk Should to I... you. <laughs> you can play to the camera. I play to the camera like John Krasinski every now and then. But I, <laughs> I'm what? What a great little like, just a little Krasinski jab. What's up? What's up? <laughs> uh, no, I'm so excited wait, to talk to you. Also, this real quick. That's a Krasinski. The Quiet Place. <laughs> My husband and I do that a lot. <laughs> it's so like. Anyway, he's by the way, talk about reinventing himself. He, <laughs> that guy is not now just all he directed that new if movie and everything. If. Oh, yeah. The imaginary friend. Yeah. yeah. Which I'm excited to see, actually. Yeah. It's on Paramount Plus, I believe. Mm -hmm. Anyways, wow. Not we, that we're doing a plug for we, if because we weren't in it. <laughs> no, we were not. We, didn't <laughs> we are not audition. paid for this. <laughs> Sarah, I'm excited to talk to you, though. I'm really uh, jazzed. I am going to be honest with you. OK. I did not know Resident Alien was a thing, sadly, sure. until we scheduled this. Um, and then I watched the pilot last night. It was fucking delightful. I awesome. wish I had known about it. It was really fun, clever, okay. unique. Uh, Welcome. Alan's great. You're great. Thanks. Alice uh, is great. Everybody's really great. And I wish I had known about it. <laughs> okay. Uh, I appreciate your honesty. <laughs> and um, that you're not uh, far off from a lot of audience members, actually, yeah. <laughs> because it's a sci-fi show, now a USA show, mostly an NBC Universal Peacock app show. And um, it's had its ups and downs because we started in 2018. Oh, I didn't realize you started so long ago. Yeah. So we're just now, like you, Mike, yeah. being found yeah. because it just came to Netflix this year. Oh, that helps huge. Yes. And Netflix is a big, like all of a sudden now people are like, hey, this show. And we're like, we've been around for yeah, six that's, years. Because now but... you got picked up for a fourth season, right? Yeah. Wow. That's Thank so exciting. And up the and Lord. Down. What a roller coaster. Yeah, it has been. We started the pilot 2018. Um, I was waitressing. I didn't tell anyone because I was like, you know, this might not go. <laughs> So I waitressed for a whole year. I'm glad I didn't tell anybody because we didn't get picked up for a whole year. Wow. Not until November 2019 did we start shooting season one. And then March 2020, COVID shut us down. We had just gotten started, you guys. <laughs> so in the middle of filming? Like two weeks left. Two okay. weeks left. Wow. Yeah. And then we, I mean, I had my hand 
you'll get to this episode. I'm not going to tell you much, but I did have my hand like inside Alan's chest with like alien goo up my arm. And this was like the day we'd been told that is basically like the end of the world yeah, yeah. and no one knew what was happening. And I just looked at him. I had my hand in his chest and I was like, well, if I never see you again, it's been really good working with you. You know, yeah. like he's like, half- you have COVID now. I have COVID probably too. With my <laughs> right. hand. Like we had been told that morning, Alan's in half alien makeup. Like, Hey, we got to shut down for this disease the world is sh- people are going crazy in america because we're we're in vancouver when we're shooting right, right. they're like you know throwing toilet paper into their bags and running like i mean it was just crazy i remember crossing the border too like once we got across back to america because they made it seem so scary and and, and it was sure um but i was like weeping on the other side of the border and then we because my husband and i drive yeah. so Anyway, that's not what you asked. Wait, you drive to We drive Vancouver to Vancouver. Why? We like to road trip. Oh, I And we like to have a car when we're there. Like, no, 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 okay. no, no, no. No, I love planes, and especially they fly me first class. You hey, know what I mean? Yeah. But so I network. Yeah, right. And now USA Network. <laughs> right, now USA. Um, <laughs> but let me, okay, this is. This, so that's how far along. Yeah, and this I brings mean, up an interesting it. question to me, though. It's like, okay. you've been working, you've been. I assume trying to work for a very long time. You've had a few gigs here and there. And then you finally get a series regular lead, all this stuff. And then that happens. Isn't that kind of ironic? Like I, where I'm at and where a lot of people are at, it's like, if we can get one, maybe that will spin the momentum. And it's ironic that you get a big one or a semi big one. Right. Uh, You don't know if it's going to get picked up, obviously when you do the pilot, but then all those up and downs after, isn't that just funny that you never can get comfortable really? (laughs) You know, Mike, it is. It's funny. It's ironic. It's also like I've learned a lot. I think I I like talking about this, actually, because I think people have this misconception about success. And I did, too. There was a I mean, I worked so hard for so long and was like, if I could just book this one thing, then dot, dot, dot. And it's just not how it works. Like it did work in the sense that I booked a thing. A year later, it picked up. So then I did stop waitressing, which is a dream, right? For all of us out there who are are serving and slinging drinks and and steaks and potatoes, it does happen. It is real. You can get out of the waitressing job. Like, it does. it's, It's possible. But then we had the irony of the show shutting down. We weren't sure if it was going to go. It might be canceled at that point. What was wild for our show was that quarantine, I think, helped us get viewers because sci-fi is not like it's not this highly lauded network. You know, people who watch sci-fi are like loyal fans or they don't watch sci-fi. It's one or the other. So we have these incredible fans who are so committed and loyal, but we have a lot of people who are like, no, thanks, I'm not watching it if it's on sci-fi. Yeah. And so because of quarantine, more people were like, I need content, I need something. And they went through all of their normal networks and they were like, oh, Alan Tudyk, I think I remember him as the pirate. <laughs> you know, like, I'll check it out, you know, <laughs> like dodgeball. <laughs> like, sure, he looks familiar. And then they tried it out. So we actually had like over a million viewers for season one. Oh, great. For a sci-fi show, which was, so we ended up becoming their number one show on oh, and their network. Yeah. But it still wasn't like then it's COVID, then it's like people are still trying to figure things out. Now we're doing season two in the middle of COVID. It takes longer to shoot it, longer to get to air it. Like by that time, people are still like, what's this show? And, you know, we were just like catching our stride at the beginning of this year when we aired season three Mm -hmm. and then they put it on Netflix and then everybody was like, whoa, Resident Alien, like amazing, amazing, amazing. And we're like, yes, thank you. Hi, we've been here. Oh my God, nice to meet you. Like, yes, you know, but then we were like waiting until last month, which is like a long time to wait. Usually they tell you within a certain amount of time contractually, there's like a like a rollover in terms of like you need to know by a certain time or the series regulars are let go of. Yeah. And so the fact that they waited till June to let us know about season four, we were all like, is this it? Like, did we finish and that? That's all it's going to be. And that, so I, it's, 
I'm glad we're talking about it only because it feels like um, this long winded answer, which is how it feels in career well, too. It's a long winded success. Right, it's like, I, it's not, it's not like, Oh, everything's better now. Everything's different. You know, I think it even more so is the idea that you can't tie yourself to the highs and mm-hmm. the lows of this. You just have to remain or tr- try as best you can to remain even keeled throughout those things. Yeah. Yeah. Because even if you book a series regular role, there's going to be lows with that. Yes. And high. Like you just have to remain even keeled. Yeah. I mean, I think I did have a lot of lows for season one and two because it wasn't what I was promised. It was not the prince that was promised. It was like, it was, um, well, it being my first time being a series regular, I had to get out of my head and out of my own way to not feel like, I, you know, imposter syndrome, which I feel like all artists feel at some point. And I was, you know, my counterpart was Alan and he's like the ticket seller of the show. And not to say that I'm not equal to him, but in my mind in season one, when I was there, I really felt like, Oh, I gotta, I gotta show up. I gotta do my stuff. I gotta know what I'm doing. And it wasn't until the end of season one that I finally relaxed into like, Oh, right. No, I worked for this. I was cast in this for a reason. I'm allowed to be here. This is, and it wasn't until about season two that I was really like, all right. But then it was COVID, which was yeah. a completely different way of doing work. Yeah, yeah. So we haven't, as a show and as a cast, had any um, normalcy. Like, what's normal? Right, right. I don't know what that is. I really don't. That's. I feel like <laughs> when it work, I, I don't know what it's like to work on a show that's normal. Yeah, I feel like that's just <laughs> the creative endeavor in general. And I yeah. feel like you are, though, like to give you a high or maybe a positive spin. It's like at least it's now find an audience while it's still available, right? Absolutely. Like there's all those iconic shows like Freaks and Geeks and stuff that got canceled before they got discovered. Yes. And it's not going to come back. You guys got discovered while you're still eligible. You're right. And are coming back, which is amazing. Hey, you're like, right. I think of all the, like, the <laughs> artists that died and then their work sold for like millions of dollars. It's like, mm-hmm. at least that didn't happen where it was canceled. And then you're like, oh no, now you... you know no, I mean? you're right. We actually thought about that too. We were like, this could be like a Shit's Creek type of thing. Like they didn't get discovered right, really yes. until season six and then they were done. Network, yeah. 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 So, which we were like, it would be cool if it's a Schitt's Creek type of thing because they got not only recognized, but like very much beloved, you know? So yeah. we were like, that would be an amazing thing to happen, even if it's at the last minute and we're done. And technically, maybe that, like, I'm not, you know, trying to put any like bad juju on it, but we are contractually done. Like, we have reached the seven year mark in oh, TV land. Like, so if they want to continue past season four, they have to start new contracts. Oh, and we're in a time where like, that's, we don't know. So it could be that everyone's discovering it now and we will in fact be done after the season, but also it could be that we're just getting just started the start, yeah. and I don't know which way it's going to go. So we're kind of all going into season four, like, it was really great working with you. It's really great knowing <laughs> you. Is, like this, this we, is, we don't know what it's gonna be. I have a funny reference. I feel like you, do you know who Chapel Roan is? Mm-mm. Like she's blowing up now. She's a musician, but she put out a song during COVID called Pink Pony Club. Okay. And it just got on the Billboard Hot 100 last week or something. Fuck yeah. And it's very similar to that. Like yes. It, I I love that. That's so great. But wait, let's double down on what you just talked about with the seven year contract thing and stuff. Are you guys theoretically then doing better because it was a network as far as like residuals, resids? Yes. And so we never had the streaming thing at the start. Eventually, you know, NBC took it to its own streaming, you know, network in terms of Peacock. But because it was a cable show, we actually do and did and still do get residuals. Which Pretty good compared to like... Compared to streaming, yeah, show, yeah. Exactly. So that, those were the conversations we were having on the line when, when everyone was striking. I actually remember having conversations with my castmates like, wow, I did not realize how awful these contracts were yeah. for residuals. And I'm, I feel very fortunate now because I am still getting a check every once in a while. Right. It's not like it's, um, you know, changing the game, but it's enough to like pay my rent for one month, right. you know, which helps keep you afloat. Yeah. And that matters right now. Like 
there's we're all just trying to stay afloat. So yeah. that in some ways there was these weird blessings we had. Quarantine was this weird blessing for our show. People discovered it when they normally wouldn't have. And then we because we were cable, smaller we network, had yeah. smaller network stuff and we had the residual contract, you know, figured out so we would still kind of get paid in that way that's awesome and a great way to look at it yeah but don't get too high because yeah gonna... <laughs> no right it's like a silver lining i'm constantly doing that mike man i am constantly like it's okay to be disappointed it's okay that it wasn't what i thought it was but it's also amazing and it's changed my life and yeah. i'm not a waitress anymore but i actually like right now i'm babysitting again because like oh. i need to make money and right. i haven't made money in a year and a half when do you start se- filming season four we don't start till November. Okay, yeah. And I, I won't get that check till December, j- January. Right. Like, who? you know what I mean? Like, once they, like, get the ball rolling. And to, look, relief is coming. I can't complain. I'm very grateful. But you know what I mean? Like, no, I don't I think still you're... Com- gotta... We don't think you're complaining. Okay, but I do I you. do love... Like, I love that you're admitting that you're babysitting, right? Like, I I'm think... babysitting. I'm making earrings. I'm, like, oh kind God. of on the grind right now. You're kind of an uh, entrepreneur. <laughs> Well, that's always how I was. Multi hyphen. Yeah, right. <laughs> that is like what an artist is, though, right? Like we have to just embrace that we're like more than one yeah. thing. You can't put us in a box, okay? <laughs> Not one box anyway. Maybe multiple boxes. Um, I always sorry to interview. I was thinking no, Jenny no. Pearson. Jenny Pearson is a comedian, UCB girl. I had her on a long time ago, and she got a series regular on an NBC show. Quit her like secretary job. It went one season, canceled sadly. And then she went back to the job and was like, fuck this. It's normal. It's calm. And this is what I have to do. And yes. I was like, yes, absolutely. That's fine. I, that's like when people ask me, like, what advice would you give like someone who's trying to get into the business? I'm like, get a good day job. Yeah. Get a day job you like. Get something that like makes you feel good, that you're good at. I was good at waitressing. I'm a multitasker. Like, I don't want to be behind a desk. I don't want to sell a product over a phone. Like, mm. I can definitely like make you feel better though if you want to come in and sit at my table and I can like, you know, help you get a meal. Like, I was good at that. So I got to a place, there was definitely a moment in my waitressing career where I was like so resentful and was like, this is never going to happen. I'm never going to make it. And then I don't know what it was, but I definitely pivoted into, wait, 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 wait. This is the career. The career is me paying my rent and auditioning. That's the career. The bonus is the work. Yes. When you book it. The career is making money. That has nothing to do with your art so that you don't stress about making money with your art. Yes. That's I, the career. That's a good soundbite. I agree with that 100% because like, then you are so stressed out while you're trying to do something that you enjoy. Yes. And it just ruin, it corrupts it in, in, to some degree. I'm actually, I was just talking about this with my therapist. I am now doing in this weird place of I'm not, okay, so I'm going to get season four yes but because it's been a year and a half since i've really made any income i am like do i take my art i know i have fans is this uh, something you capitalize on Mm. not on purpose but like conventions and stuff you mean yeah Yeah. like conventions and so i'm actually going to do my first convention at the end of august dragon con in atlanta which i'm excited about but i didn't i never did that before because i didn't really have a much of a following and I I don't know what it's like to really have fans like yeah. so now that I sort of do it feels weird you're like oh oh you can charge to take a photo with me like I don't want to do that but I also am like I need to live like so there's this weird thing too of like at what point are do you feel okay being an artist and making money as an artist but it's still being something that you are capitalizing on you should totally feel fine with that. I mean, I don't know. You, it's weird. Like, I see wanna... how many celebrities sell credit cards and they should feel horrible about that, but they <laughs> right. don't at all. And they're just pushing credit card you're debt right. for you're big right. banks on yes, you're right. people. Yes. Fuck all those celebrities. Yeah, man. you're right. I hate that. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> Side I Side rant. It's a weird. I'm sure there are people listening that understand. It's this weird thing of like, you want to be an artist and you want to just connect to people in that way. But what is it what what does that amount to and what does that mean in terms of cost right you know cost of living but also like cost of your soul like you know it's so it's this weird balance of like now i'm making earrings and i sell them on my etsy but i know that a lot of people who buy them are fans and so it's a nice opportunity for me for me to say hey i'll make you a custom pair of earrings and i'll also thank you for being a fan and we have this nice little back and forth yeah you know what i mean but it's not like i still feel like it's a nice 
what'd like give and take. What did your therapist say? She she was basically like, you need to embrace like the position that you're in yeah, and and you know I think you're overthinking it i i think you're right <laughs> i think we just met and you've already like learned a lot about me <laughs> i'm just very uh high eq you know what i mean I, yeah yeah i know what's happening yeah you do do you, do you think you're that, up there with the vibrations thank you mm-hmm. do you think that um and and uh, this i do not mean this as a knock at all if it comes across as a knock but okay. do you think are you glad that you found success later in life and i i ask that because I feel like this is all these questions come from my selfish, uh, you know, need for whatever. I I hold on to the hope of like Ray Romano and yeah. and Tim Allen, but even Tim Allen. I think I'm older than Tim Allen now. But Ray Romano got his sitcom when he was like 50 or whatever, right? Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, okay, I got time. I got time. Yeah. And you're, I think we're similar age, and you and you got Resident Alien actually pretty young if it was seven years ago i guess but, <laughs> right but it, later in the thir- mid 30s i I'm guess i'm still 18 what do you mean mike <laughs> you were born after 9 11 <laughs> but are you glad you got you found it a little later Absolutely. not fresh out of college no, or yeah no 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 if i had found it fresh out of college i would be a different person i probably would be like somewhere else entirely i don't even know if i would still be in the business because i would have lost myself i needed time to like figure out who i was what i stood for and then i needed to be able to to land my first big role as something that really i resonated with um on a emotional energetic level and i wouldn't have had that in my 20s i just wouldn't have but at the same time i kind of I don't know if I willed this or manifested it for myself, but I went into the whole Hollywood of it all knowing it was going to take a long time. Like I went in being like, I showed up to LA in 2007 and I would like regularly look at celebrities that I liked or, you know, admired. And I would look at the moment on their IMDb that they like kind of got on the map. Yeah. And then how long it took them to like get on the map. Right. You know, and for, Almost every single one of them, it was 10 years. 10 years between the first and the yes. first gig and really yes. interesting. Yes, before they really were like kind of known. Yeah. You know, and even then it was like how many more years before they were like in Game of Thrones or like in whatever's the hot thing right now, right? Like it's, or, or that they're really a household name. Like if you think about Emma Stone, right? Like she started with Easy A and it took her 10 years just to get to a place where People were like, I know Emma Stone. I yeah. know that name. Now, what is it? Five to 10 years later, she's just now getting Oscar recognition. Right. And it's not to say like, oh, poor Emma Stone. It's like she's, no, yeah, it's you a, know what I mean? It's a slog, though? Yeah. It's a, right. I think people, I, I say it because I think people think when you get here, it's just going to happen overnight. And I remember when I first moved here, so many people like moving away after three years like five years was their max if they didn't have a certain amount of time. And I just was like, no, 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 no. It's like lifelong. This is a, this is the career. And I'm like, I, if I have to Glenn close it and, you know, find something later on in my life or Morgan Freeman, which he was like 45 or something when he did Shawshank. Oh, interesting. Yeah. And he's, but you think Morgan's been around a long time, but when you look back, like he really, and he probably has. He was probably doing all kinds of stuff in his 20s and 30s we don't know anything about. But he wasn't on screen. We right. didn't know him as Morgan Freeman until later in his life. So I'm all about it. I'm like, the more I can have that longevity going into my later years, the more my career will be fulfilling for my whole life. Yeah. So I'm glad it started now because I have like a good foundation. Foundation of not working and knowing what those lows are like. Yeah, yeah. right. <laughs> right. Some patience. Yeah. And, like, but still having that. To hand it to you. Yeah. You know, still having those moments where you're like, I'm older now. Do I really want to do this grind? Do I really want to be in this? Do I really want to be fighting for who I am? Like, or, or for what I stand for or, you know, yeah, it's still like as much as I have success with this show, people still don't know who I am. They still don't, they still don't know my work unless they know the show. And even then they don't know me. That's just one show. Like I still have a long way to go. It's probably going to be another 10, 15 years for me before I I'm really 
in, and again, not putting any bad juju on myself. Maybe not. Maybe it's only two years from now where I get some really big booking, but like, it's still a grind. Yeah, yeah. You know? And I feel like the Box Angeles bump doing my podcast, after about five years, you do my podcast, you, you pop off. Yes. Okay, I had thanks. like Glenn Powell thanks, on like Mike. five years ago. I had wow. Monica Barbaro on like wow. five years ago. And they, yeah, and then they popped off. So. Thank you. I gave you a little boost. Hey, <laughs> I like it. Thanks. I get the mic boost. Thank you so much. Wait, I'll let... remember you and I'll thank you when I get yeah, my send Oscar the elevator speech. back down. Okay. <laughs> I will. All the I, golden all elevator. I need is a co-star at this point. <laughs> uh, I'd love to. Speaking of, I'd love to ask you about. Like you mentioned, you hadn't been a series regular before Resident Alien. You had a couple recurrings, I think, right? Yeah. But like, what was your audition like? Was there a? a did you see a steady growth in what you were auditioning for, or was it? Was the series regular random that you got for this, or were you regularly auditioning for series regulars? How, like, for me, yeah. I've had like two guest star auditions, but a ton of co stars, mm-hmm. and I haven't booked shit. But, like, did, was it a natural progression for you, or was. Um, I remember there was like a solid five year grind with the pilot season stuff. Yeah. Like, it was, it was like. The moment I understood I need to be a brand, I need to have a website back when websites were a thing, like it became this like, excuse me, it became this like I need to like know what I'm going out for, go to certain showcases with agencies, like try to like, you know, get to know casting. Like I was sending out like headshots, resumes still when that was also still a thing like 10 years you know, uh, ago or whatever. But like it it got to a place where I did audition for co-stars. I auditioned for guest stars. It was sort of like I could see there was a little bit of a, a shift. Once I booked one thing, then mm. I could sort of see a shift in like what I was now being given the opportunity to get into. But I had a series regular audition that I got close to getting, I don't know, two or three years prior to Resident Alien. And it's a blessing I didn't get it. Um, I don't want to shit on the show so I won't mention it but it was something that would have been monetarily longer and more beneficial but I actually went on that show later um, and saw some of the people working on it and I could tell it was not fulfilling them Mm -hmm. in their soul and I was like I'm glad I dodged that bullet. I think like we got to be careful what we wish for here. It's one thing to be like I want to book a series regular but what kind how long how do you fit in how do you fit in how do you have a voice like because just because you get that and you get that paycheck doesn't mean that it's going that's been the craziest part so not to go too far off of what you asked but i did see a change a shift once i would book one thing but i did also have a casting director that i or like a a, an agent that i didn't work with but that was a sort of an acquaintance at the time who was trying to help me out early on in my career. And she was basically like, you know, you need to go out for this role. It's a co-star or whatever, but it had no lines and it wasn't something I was really interested in. And I just said, Hey, I've read, a, I've read the script. Like I appreciate it, but I'm, I'm going to turn this down. And she went off on me. She was like, I'm trying to help you out and you're never going to get anywhere. You're never going to amount to anything. You can't get a guest star until you get a co-star and you can't get a series value until you get a guest star. And I'm going to tell you something right now. I never fucking had a co-star and I had a series regular. Thank you very much. Wow. Suck it, lady. Suck it. I never fucking did a we co-star. Should, we I went straight to fucking guest star because that just worked out for me. It doesn't always work out. And I get what she's saying in general, but like also fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> like, my, don't let anyone tell you you can't. Like, my e- honestly. <laughs> my EQ is saying you need to take this to your therapist, by the way, because you're holding on to a lot of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Those vibrations. I'm like, it's fine. It's fine. No, but I just, I do think. Well, it's interesting. That example is interesting because I find like from friends I've talked to, it's like once they get a guest star, their agents won't submit them to co-stars. Absolutely. And also there's some, there is a thing where annoying. you can get stuck. There's a thing where you can get stuck yeah, in I the think... guest star and not being seen as the series regular. Yeah. I've had friends who have been in that position too, where it's like you really do want to be considered for other bigger types of roles, but it just, it's, it's going to come along when it comes along. And in the meantime, you just work on what you can yeah. when you can, right? you know, even if it's not stuff you're getting paid for, student films, like friend 
projects like we need to keep the like muscle pumping otherwise you're going to lose some sort of like respect for the art yeah have you been actively auditioning right now like in between yeah. seasons of resident but Alien? not as much as i i mean honestly that's another thing that was a surprise some of that was due in part to my old agency that i have since let go of because they weren't fulfilling what I felt like was the right type of drive for helping me get those auditions. They were like, that's good enough. And I was like, that's not good enough right. for me. Um, and they have since disbanded. So I, I, I guess I saw the writing on the wall there. But, <laughs> we're not going to say names, but maybe. And was yes. It a monster? <laughs> Names, yes. Mark Measures that stole from all his <laughs> Yes, cards. yes. Wow, that's funny that I sniped that. Yeah, really, that's your EQ. That's my, oh, I keep I hitting your bike. Is this You're fine. Okay, great. You can move it slightly if you need to. You don't have to. You, no, you I just talk you, a lot with You can <laughs> touch it if you need to touch it. Mike, this is becoming a different it's podcast. It's not a hot potato. <laughs> oh, my God. There's video. Calm down. <laughs> Jesus. My husband's going to be watching this. There's video. <laughs> um... <laughs> Wait, what was the question? Uh, it was talking about guest star uh, auditioning backwards. And, yes, uh, but then you just asked something else. Wait, 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 wait. Where, where, where were we at? You, we were talking about your agent left you. Oh, yeah, yeah, Oh, yeah. auditioning now. Yes, I was surprised. I thought... This is another like thing that you think like, oh, I'm going to book and then it will be like this domino right, effect. And, and it wasn't. No, no. I booked... Once you get a series regular, there's a little bit of like a blessing and a curse that comes with that because... Like you said, once you go to guest star, you're not going to go out for co-star anymore. Which I disagree with personally, but I don't. What the fuck do I know? You know, uh, I think there's something to being relevant and being active. Seen the problem is if you're only seen as a co-star, then they'll treat you as a co-star. You need to go up to that next level, and then once you're at that next level, to go backwards to backtrack for a lot of agents and managers is like is backtracking. So I get that, but at the same time, I kind of also feel like any work is good work. Yeah. Um. But same sort of true for series regular it's it's not to say that i couldn't do a cameo or a guest star on something but it's a lot harder to get that when you have a certain contract or a schedule and you have to kind of get permission to work on a certain right. type of show or yeah. whatever and because of covid a lot of stuff was shut down anyways but i mean i i booked resident alien 2018 and i haven't booked anything since the beginning of this year wow. it took like it's not like i was working on other stuff in the interim and i had like a year off in between each so season. six years you went without booking something. Yeah. Not even a commercial? No. Wow. But I also, I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't have a commercial agent specifically. Like my managers and my agents, my age, I have a new agent now. Like they, they are looking for all the things. Yeah. But like at the time when I was with this other agency, it just felt sort of, they were doing their best, but it was, it wasn't good enough. Wow. Yeah. See, to me, I find that so fascinating. Like, it seems like people get pigeonholed. Like, I go out so much commercially, but not as much theatrically. And I feel like a lot of theatrical people I talk to don't go out much commercially. And I'm like, that's so weird. It's a different realm, I feel like. I remember is, going but... out for commercials, like, earlier in my career. I the Same thing w with certain, I don't know. I just, I remember going to a commercial audition and they were like, show me your hands. And I was like... Uh, like that's hilarious. I didn't know what that meant. Did you have I, a BFA? You, no, uh, like you don't have a BFA. No. What did you graduate with? I thought I read you graduated with a BFA. Oh well, yes, I guess. Wait, what's a BFA? Bachelor of uh -oh. Fine Arts. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I don't to... have a BFA. Oh God, you no, I don't. No. Um, they don't teach you how to show your hands in a BFA program. See, that's so no. interesting. Do you? I didn't do commercial. No, that's what I mean. Also. It's funny because it was a Bachelor of Arts. I, I BFA. It wasn't fine arts. It was okay. just BA. Got like it was a BA in, in theater, theater and dance. Got right. Okay. That was what it was called. That's why I was like, what's a BFA? <laughs> Big fucking art deal. Okay. Fucking ass. <laughs> it's a different um, podcast. No, I went to school for musical theater. I see. Okay. It was a completely different program. Got and it. even if you had done film or television there, we had just gotten started with a film television department that at that time in, in my college career. And so they were just like starting to figure out what kind of classes to give students. Like we, my university wasn't known for like, go here for art, yeah. you know, it just happened to be a great musical theater and dance school. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, but anyways, <laughs> we've gotten so sidetracked. You put in front of your face. You put them in front of your you face. If you didn't know, and it's okay if you don't know. 
God. You always ask. <laughs> I, by the way, I just had a commercial in person with a little girl. <laughs> I'm going to sound so mean. She stunk. Oh, no. Puberty? <laughs> no, no, not smell. Like, she, oh. her, her performance was... She, She's bad. Yeah, she wasn't great. Well, no, we were fake wrestling, and, like, she was supposed to follow me in, and she just didn't move, and she was just looking at everyone, and there's like, three casting people trying to get her to do it. I was trying to get her to do it, and she was just like... <laughs> now that's something that we need to talk about with the parents like if she's not actively like trying then maybe we shouldn't force I, her to do an audition <laughs> you know what i mean like well, she did it before the camera was on which is ironic oh, okay okay. and then once the camera goes on she's just hey, looking at she's us got that, idiot like... adults doing it <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, no. she's got she's got like uh, what is that like she just gets real scared when the camera comes on we we, we get Stage it right and Stage I, fright, yeah yes. i was i was just like laughing at myself doing these wrestling moves trying to get her and she just doesn't want anything to do with it. (laughs) Yeah. That's awesome. Sorry. You had that experience. That's what you're missing in commercial auditions is the group audition. But that's a great, I bet you did a great job pretending she was getting into it and you, yeah, I mean, how many times are you in a scene with a partner and they're like looking right through you? It's not like everybody connects with you perfectly. You know, you have these moments where you're like, I'm right here. Hey, and they're just like they've got an idea of a way of doing, and they're like, "You're like, I'm not back there. I'm right here. Hmm, connect. What? <laughs> yeah, that's tricky. Especially you know? with like readers. You know what I mean? Readers oh, yeah. are, are tricky for that. I love reading for people for that very reason because I cannot stand like cold, dead readers. And yeah. I get that like you got to be able to read with anyone, but I love love being on the other side of the camera helping out what speaking of what's your how how do you feel about self-tapes where's your where's your head at on the world of god i used to loathe self-tapes because i couldn't handle looking at myself and like i would honestly do one liner and it would be like 20 takes and i would be like i don't know which one's good and i got to a place where it, it started becoming more um likable because i just said um, that's it. I'm giving myself like three takes. If I was in an audition room right now, that's all I'd get anyway. I'm not going to like, yeah. if it's not perfect, if I missed a line, like whatever, you know, unless I really felt like I could do it one more time and nail it. Um, I got to a place where I just sort of let go of how I looked. And um, one of my first bookings off self tape was Sneaky Pete. And oh, wow. I actually happened to stumble on that. I don't keep all my self tapes, but I happened to stumble on like an actor folder I had in my computer. And I somehow still had that self tape. And I watched it back and I was like, that's a strong audition. Nice. I was really proud of myself. <laughs> I'm like, thanks for booking because that I should have, you know, but it doesn't always work like that. Yeah. And so I feel in terms of, I miss being in the room with people. I miss that. I do miss the feeling of walking in and being like, hey, Katie, how are you today? Okay, I'll stand here. Sure. My name's Mike. You got my name wrong. (laughs) You don't get it. (laughs) You're fired. Um, Yeah, I miss it. Because they make or break that sense of like, oh, this is real. It's happening. For self-tape, for me, I feel like... Well, there's a little... Fi- Sorry. There's a little like... No, no. F- performance, like st- stepping on a stage that gets under yes. you in that room, whereas yes. the self-tape, when you're doing it here against a wall, it's like... Yes. It's, there's a coldness to and it. And also, you have, an, amped. you have an opportunity as an actor when you're in the room to be directed, which we old. all want and love to be directed. Please direct us. We are actors. Yeah. And... Um, you don't get that on self tape, but it doesn't mean I haven't booked off self tape, so it's not awful. It's just I do miss being in the room, but it's not even an option anymore. Now they're giving you Zoom audition options, but it's not like being in the room is like a thing. Yeah. At least I don't know. I haven't been invited back into a room <laughs> since 2018. <laughs> do you do you pay to do self tapes or anything, or are you just all by yourself? Do you coach or anything? No, no, on? I do them myself. My husband's a director, a filmmaker acting coach so, so I, coach. I have an in-house yes coach nice. reader which On is retainer. nice yeah oh yeah it's nice <laughs> that's why i married him um one of the many reasons but no i i do have my own setup i got to a place where i was like get good lighting get a thing that's easy so it does one of those like flip up background settings and now i have like a whole thing yeah for self-tape but i do like literally recently my my agent sent me a an audition and they were like do you want to do the zoom and i was like should i i mean it's been so long since i've even been asked that question and they were like yeah if you can get in front of them you should so then i of course go to do it but i'm like too late and they're all snagged up so 
Apparently, you should. Wait, if you oh, can. interesting. So they gave some people a Zoom option and the rest self tapes. Basically, what happens is if you say yes, you're going to audition, you have like a certain amount of time to like go and nab a spot. What? Yeah. What? what who? Ca- what was? The, who was the casting on this? I don't remember. It's not just. It's not just them though. It's like oh, this is kind that, of. Yeah sort of the experience I've had, which is, and it's only happened like two or three times, but it, it's like, oh, I need to get on it because people want to meet people. They want to connect. And yeah, I yeah. get that. So I wish, I wish you could do a self tape and still get feedback or something. And Hey, we really liked it, but you know, try this. You still get that direction. But Agreed. But no. I've interviewed a lot of casting people recently and I don't They're think like, it's going to happen. Nope. No, no, it, I get it. Also, too much. also, I mean, it must be, I would assume for casting, really great in the sense that like if you see someone and it works and whatever then it's like okay we don't have to go through five rounds of callbacks i mean that must be really relieving for them to not have to do it the way they used to but i mean i just miss people yeah (laughs) i feel like a hermit i got a two-parter uh it's similar well i'll just do one at a time i guess so you mentioned like sort of the downtimes through resident alien like how and then obviously we had COVID and the strike and everything how do you stay up or stay motivated during those down or how do you reset? I don't know. What is your approach to sort of those down times? Yeah. Um, hmm. <laughs> um, I think when I am really down, I kind of turn to, I'm a tarot person. So I turn to my tarot, my runes, my journaling, and I do sort of what I call my soul station. I kind of like sit with self and I try to figure out what's going on internally by turning the cards and tarot is all about intuition and sort of bringing out things that you didn't realize were just right there in front of you. Um, So that's helpful to me. But in general, I try to remember that there's like on my worst days, it's hard. I'll probably just have a good cry, eat a donut and watch Lost, you know, like something that's familiar and that I don't have to think about, you know. But on my best days, I try to remember like that is part of the career. It is an ebb and a flow. We're just this giant ocean and we're all these little fish swimming in it. And sometimes we catch a wave and sometimes we don't. And sometimes we're floating on top of the surface enjoying the sun. And sometimes we're drowning and the island is right there and you can see it and you can taste it, but you can't get on it. Like that is the career. That felt like a lost reference. I've been watching a lot of episodes. I've seen it already, but I am actually watching reruns. I'm excited. It's it's now on Netflix. Well, well, the second part of that was like, how do you, I guess, stay? Are you are you are you doing anything to stay top of mind with like casting? Are you sending anything out? Are you are you actively shooting anything yourself? Yeah, are I mean, you I talked doing to my... any creative things outside. Yeah. I mean, other than like the earrings and things. But yeah, like, yeah industry related um, stuff like i just filmed our mutual friend carrie i just filmed a scene for our reel together me and her just nice. because, like, i'm sitting here why not let's do it yes and so i've done that a couple times in the last couple months it's like just doing things like that Anything i like that. i have been I, I a friend of mine reached out and i did like one day on his indie film at the top of the year then another acquaintance of my husband and i was working on a film and we all agreed like let's work on this together so tj played the villain and i played the oracle and it was this really cool in, independent fantasy film so i'm i'm keeping active with my community i'm also taking class again which has oh, been really yeah, great yeah, yeah. love that um what class It's a Chekhov study uh, with a a woman named Maria Rika Michaela, and she's incredible if you have a chance to study with her if you live here. Um, She is an amazing Chekhov technique artist. And um, I had never, I'd studied Chekhov like, like I read books in college, but I had never actually like studied that technique like in the body. So that's been really nice. But also just to dive back into, like remembering I'm a thespian <laughs> like and I want to like do scene study and try things and like not just get into one way I think sometimes when you book I've seen a lot of people who have success and they're bored they're not being directed and they're not being told no and like they need to dive back in like remember that there's things that you can challenge yourself with. There's all kinds of different types of acting and performance art that you can get into. So I'm taking class again. 
I'm also working on like my musical theater reel, like I, I, or my musical reel as I'm calling it because I'm a singer, but nobody really knows. So yeah. I'm working on that so I can give that to my agents and manager and go, Hey, this is an option. I'm, you know, let, allowing myself to be local hire, which not everybody's cool with, but I'm like, Hey, if I can work on it, then I'll fly myself to New York. It's fine. You know, like I think there's this idea that once you get to a certain place, you shouldn't have to spend money on this or that. And it's like, that's not how it works no. until you're the one percent of anything <laughs> like it's just not how it works yeah. so i'm not doing anything directly related to casting it's not like i'm contacting casting and being like hey remember me but i have given my managers and agents a list of people that i know that i've worked with before directors casting that i had a great session with and reminding them hey if this comes up if this person shows up like letting your people know who know you? Yeah, because they always say like it's who it's all about who you know, and I'm like bullshit. It's all about who knows you. Yeah, like do you remember me when we and I did this audition ten years ago? Probably not, but I remember you because you said this thing to me, and then they're like, "What? Get in here!" Yeah, <laughs> you know, it's that kind of networking that that makes a difference. But I'm trying to do that when when I can. I love that. I I, I, I just I think a lot of this stuff is such. I I don't want to say low hanging fruit, but it's an easy win. Like I just took a class that was an audition class, Robert Diavonzo, and it was like he didn't assign the stuff beforehand. You got it in the middle of the class. You got like forty five minutes, mm -hmm. and then you had to run it. And like every week, I was ninety nine percent off book. Yeah, and it was such like a little ego boost every week that I could get something new and like do good with it every week. And like yeah, just doing things like that are such small wins, and it's important to keep sort of them filming a real scene or whatever. Yeah, well, also like the memorization technique is incredible for your brain and your muscles and it's going to be so much better for you in general if someone hands you something it's even like on t uh, in tv there will be rewrites that right, happen right. in the moment and if you have better skill set of like memorizing quick and on the spot and getting it in your body like that's a great skill set to have and to be able to do that i just feel like that's something you can be working on you know other tools that's uh, like that's like tools and techniques to to have but having a friend you read a play with just cause like get together and read plays. Like, I don't know, keep the, keep the dream alive, <laughs> you know, like act like it's college, even though it ain't college anymore. We all used that's to remember exactly that. It. No, that's you know, really, we would like read is... plays and go to the quad and we would talk about things and we like very different college experience. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What did you do? I studied engineering. So. Oh, okay. okay, okay. That's <laughs> My, I was like, you were like, let's make things with our hands. Triangles. <laughs> That's cool too. No, it's not. <laughs> Hammer. So boring. <laughs> Screw. I did not go to the quad and sing musicals. <laughs> I wish I did. That sounds delightful. But I, I, you're right. It's like extra credit, right? It's like you don't have to theoretically do this, no. but it helps and it, it's good. It and does. It, it keeps also, your head right. Doing all kinds of like my my best friend's learning Japanese right now. Why? Because she went to Japan last summer and she wanted to be able to communicate, but also she's continuing to learn. Yeah. And she literally just ran into someone at a store and and they ended up having a conversation. Oh, cool. And she just she just was like, maybe this'll who knows? There's no reason that she would ever necessarily play someone who is Japanese because right. she's white, but maybe she would need to play a role where she needs to know Japanese. Yeah. Domo origato. Yeah, exactly. So I don't know. I just feel like I, I don't know. Learn. Be a student. No, I, it's a great point. And like, I, I even think your earrings are something, there's something to be said about just that creative energy. I interviewed yes, George Basil. using your hands. George Basil a couple months ago, and he was like, I'm a tinkerer. I like to build. And that's just mm -hmm. creates my tinkering with a lawnmower or I whatever. I love that name. George Basil. George Basil. Okay. Do you know George Basil? No. He was on like Wrecked. He was in Barbie. He was this <gasps> very small role in Barbie. I probably know his face. I'm so much better with faces. Than he's, he's got long hair and he's a hippie kind of. <laughs> okay, great. He's an improv guy. It's you a great name. Uh, yeah. Oh, I just messed this up worse. Uh, yeah, I think it's all good. Like, it's just, did you read the Rick Rubin book? Mm -mm. Uh, about like creative and uh, creativity and how we're all creative and we just, there's creativity floating around and we just got to grab it when it comes to us and, mm -hmm. and, and put out what, what we're feeling or whatever. No, I, I've not read that, that book, but I have heard of like um, the concept of what you were <laughs> EQ, the vibrations, the frequencies, this concept of like, it's all up here. It's just who's listening and who plucks who it. Who plucks it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Very similar. Yeah. yeah. And so, and that, that multiple p people pluck it at different times, but who's willing to do something with it? Who's willing to take it to the next step? Because it's not just about, I mean, how many of us sit around and have these ideas that we're thinking about. I have so many things. I'm a writer, okay? I have so many 
things I have started, but I have not done anything with. Yeah. I have a short story novel. I have poetry books. I have scripts. I have screenplays. I have all kinds of stuff that I have yet to like. I'm working on a pilot right now. Like I have things, but until I get that next incentive to like put it into motion, it's just sitting there on my screen. Like, <laughs> thank you. I'm giving you, you giving some vibrations. To get one of those done. <laughs> get that short hey, story novel. If done I get the pilot going, I'm going to cast you in it. Oh my god! I, you heard it here first. All right. There you go. Then then we'll be giving back to one another. I book something. I'm so happy. <laughs> I'm so happy. <laughs> I'm sure I'll get cut. <laughs> no, uh, no, uh, n- never. Speaking of like you, j- writing is part of that too. Like, do you have sort of, and I, nobody really does. And I, this is just me asking because I'm type A. But do you nobody like, really have, does? I don't well, know what you're going to say. <laughs> do you have like time? Do you do you manage your time at all? Do you like try to budget certain amount of like personal time versus work work time versus creative time? I just had this conversation with. TJ because he um, needs to manage his time in a way that he doesn't get overwhelmed and we yeah. were talking about how like when you have to work for yourself it can be really hard like he's editing and right now so it's like we agreed how about we do the Canadian way Monday through Friday you work eight Canadian. hours is that everywhere no oh, I mean sure everywhere <laughs> in other jobs but I mean in acting I world see. we oh. work every day Got all day 24 hours right um, but I was like in, in the, in Vancouver, it's like, these are your set hours on set. It's like a nine to five job and then yeah. you have weekends off or whatever. So we talked about managing that time for him. That way he had like, even if from one to nine, you like are playing Madden, you are thinking about your scripts, you're doing whatever you want. I don't care what you're doing, but you're, you're designating time for yourself to like do what it is you feel yeah. like you need to be doing right now. So I... I don't necessarily make that much of a schedule for myself, but I do recognize that I need to like sit down and think about things. And I have a friend who we're, we're going to start having accountability dates mm-hmm. where, where we're like, Hey, let's meet up and have some coffee and bring our laptops. And it's just going to be focused two hours of like writing and getting the next thing moving, you know, where it's like, sometimes you just need to have people who you sit next to who are like, yes, what are you working? What do you, and yeah. it's not necessarily about even collaborating so much as it is like, make me do it, sit down and, and, and I don't, I don't have focused scheduled time, but I schedule, I do love a schedule and I do like to schedule things, but I'm not always like guitar lessons at one and, you know, earring making at three and writing my script at five. Although it probably would serve me a little better if I did that. <laughs> I'm giving you so much of therapy. Well, I ask because like I wrestle with this. I think every creative person wrestles with this. I have all this treasure trove of content on my computer of videos after hours and hours of video and it's like oh i quote unquote should be making that into social media clips and putting that out there yeah and that should voice in the back of our head you're shooting all over like yourself you're you're struggling <laughs> with it yeah you're like shooting all over yourself <laughs> you're shooting and it's like, everywhere no i shouldn't always rest is important relaxation is important and i need to so i find like Whenever I do new podcasts, it's like Sunday morning I edit it, and then Monday night I edit the clips type of thing. And then I'm you have not, a routine. Yeah, I try to put a routine around it, That's so then great. I'm not Tuesday night when I'm being lazy and pizza rolls watching Lost, Resident Alien. <gasps> hey, uh, I don't he feel guilty, and that should I'm not shooting myself as hard as I. I Here's could. what I think. I just had this conversation with a friend who was also stressed out about time management. And I think we are these fragile, sweet baby human beings that speak for yourself. Should all- <laughs> then- I'm, a, I'm a bad boy. <laughs> um, we are always telling ourselves to have deadlines, expectations, rules. We're putting all kinds of stuff on ourselves that aren't real. It's yeah. not real. It doesn't yeah. exist. Like, If you feel like you want to do something, you're going to do it. Otherwise, you're not going to do it. And maybe there's ways that you're procrastinating or escaping or whatever. But eventually, you'll wake up and you'll get it done. I I just really believe that. I believe that like when it's important enough, when it's something you really need, you'll do it. It's every big decision I've ever made in my life. I like hemmed and hawed and worried and cried. And what am I this? And talked to friends. And then literally, it the way it happened is I woke up one day and was ready. There's no way to push that river. There's no way to like make it go faster. You're just in it and you have to go with the flow. And like, I just think it's not fair to yourself 
to be like, oh, I fucked up because I didn't do any of this thing tonight. And I'm I'm a loser because I did, you know, like I, I we all have that bad voice that talks to us about what we should right. be doing. But I feel like you will when you're ready. Yeah, you will. I, I believe in you, man. And I believe in myself and I believe in human beings who have the ability to have drive and like work ethic there's no way you're not going to get it done. It's just going to be sort of a divine timing thing. Yeah. I really believe that. So yeah. it's it's like a matter of, I think more importantly, is like making space for that to happen. Meaning like, I don't, like if I want to paint, I don't have my paints in a drawer where I can't see them. I pull out the canvas, I pull out the brushes and I like, if it's just going to sit there and look at me, it will, but eventually I'm probably going to pick up the thing and you know what I mean make it make an art piece so I feel like out of out of mind like um out of sight out of mind is a real thing obviously you <laughs> you can't have everything out all the time and it's not like it works like that with certain ideas but that's where the accountability stuff comes in it's like if I do make a schedule and I do say hey I'm meeting with this friend at two o'clock and we're not gonna fuck around we're gonna sit and we're gonna be like we get to talk for half an hour and then we're going to pull up our laptops. It's like it is it's pulling it out in front of you and not hiding from it. But I just I don't know. You'll do it when you're ready and when the time is right. And if that time's not until you're like 55, Mike, it's OK. Well, there's also you actually kind of just hit. Uh, thank you. You also kind of just hit the Rick Rubin book. It's like. There's going to be an inspiration that pushes that creativity Absolutely. to you. And or pain. That. Obviously, we like we make tons of art from pain, but like I think sometimes there's this feeling that everything has to be perfect and just right. And like some of the most inspired times are the times I've been through shit. Yeah. And then all of a sudden I'm like, I'm angry. I'm gonna pull out my charcoal and like and, you know. And then all of a sudden I'm like, wow, that's beautiful. <laughs> I love that the the pain was the charcoal. The charcoal feels like a pain. <laughs> it did. Uh, when I got my divorce, device. I, I was married before I, I'm married now, but before that I had a husband and um, he, I just had that happen. Like right as we were like finishing our relationship, I had this vision. He was like turned away from me and I don't know. I don't know if you've ever seen Great, great Expectations but he like furiously charcoals Gwyneth Pal Paltrow, Ethan Hawke's character. He like furiously like he's like so obsessed. And I saw him and I saw our whole relationship falling apart. And all I wanted to do was charcoal in that moment. Wow. I'd never been a charcoal artist in my life, Mike. And all of a sudden I went out and bought charcoal and was just charcoaling his his fucking body and like everything because I was like, it's over. <laughs> but I don't know. I got some really cool pieces. I out wouldn't of even it. know where to buy charcoal. I would go to like the grocery <laughs> store and get some like Kingsford char <laughs> charcoal bricks. <laughs> There's really great art stores. Um, Michaels, named after me. Yeah, Michaels. There you go. Uh, we're almost to an hour. I have one last question. Um, who took a chance on you? I like to ask people that as the last question. That's a great question. I think so. Thank you. My, I immediately know my first manager. Um, I had, remember when when I was saying you had to build a website back then? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I had built a website and my um, my first two managers ever were these this couple named Shane and Candy Freeman. And they just found me. I think they were trying to, they were in Atlanta and they were trying to build their own, um, you know, sort of build from the ground up. They were looking for talent. So they were kind of seeking things out. I don't know how they stumbled on my website, but they did. They contacted me. It was one of those situations where I was like, is this Sus. real? Yeah. yeah. But after having conversations with them and then meeting them in person, it was obvious that they were just hard workers who were trying to build something over in Atlanta, but they wanted to have LA talent. Mm. And um, they eventually introduced me to my, my first, like, big time manager zach james and he Wait, is, they were a manager that introduced you to yeah because manager? they ended up they ended up trying and it not working out for uh, them they had a lot going on they they really were just they were such amazing people with strong work ethic and they wanted to make this company happen and they had a few clients but then they basically said to me like it was kind of a, a beautiful thing because they were like we're you're you're trying to make your way up we're trying to make our way up maybe we can help each other and i was just like that's cool but they did introduce me they got me my first um abc showcase which introduced me to zach and zach is the reason i 
got the resident alien audition. So wow. it's like the, all of that. It was 10 years later. Yeah. But Zach, I would say between Shane and Candy and then them introducing me to Zach, who really believed in me, like never made me do anything I didn't want to do. Like always I was, I was able to talk to him. I was able to tell him what I wanted and he was always so supportive and a, an amazing mentor. Um, he was on my side and like in the end he ended up, he's now a surf instructor who makes like furniture. Yeah. He's like not even in it anymore, but he is still a good friend. He is, um, a mentor to me always. And I will never forget him. Like, you know, really having my back in a time that I, didn't have anybody yeah. like, you know, I, so I'd, I'd say collectively those three people were like the impetus. I love that. But the common theme is you just running through representation. <laughs> like, <laughs> you just mow them down. <laughs> I'm like, get out of my way. If you can't give me something I need. <laughs> Good for you though. Most no. people can't can get anyone to talk to them. And you're just like <laughs> knocking them down one by one. No, wait a second. Shane and Candy found me. Then they introduced me to Zach. Zach introduced me to who I'm with still, Bohemia, who I love. And then Bohemia introduced me to KMR, and KMR didn't work out. So I actually oh, okay. haven't so been that through much. that many. Okay, okay, yeah. Okay. Um, I've stayed loyal to Bohemia all this time, and thanks to Zach and... Now I'm work with Prototype, which is a new agency. We just started working together two months ago. It's a budding, forming, honeymoon-style relationship. <laughs> and we're, we're in love. <laughs> we'll see. Hopefully I won't mow through them. <laughs> oh, this just in. They are out of business. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. They're amazing. They actually came in after some of those other agencies disbanded. And they were like, we want to do this different. We want to have... We want to be agents with bedside manner. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Which is not necessarily what you get with agents. Normally no. they're like, hey, that's not what we do. That's managers. But they are wonderful people and already I'm so happy. And they've gotten oh, me some great auditions like right off the bat. Oh, I so, love that. That's beautiful. Yeah. Happy. Very cool. Well, this was a delight. Did you have fun? I had so much fun. Oh my gosh. I want to tell you, this is my first ever podcast like this. What do you mean? In person? In person. That's crazy. With the microphone and like on the couch. I see it happen all the time. I'm like, man, one day I'll get to do that. But all my podcasts that I've done have been over Zoom. Yeah, I hate it's Zoom. Like quarantine it's, it's world. It's not fun. Yeah. Like it's not personal. No. I'm, you're not going to read. It's like, it's like it's self tapes. Fun. It's like yeah. you're not in the room. Exactly. You're not vibing exactly. off the other person. Yeah. So I appreciate you popping my official podcast cherry. I refuse here to do Zoom. On Box Angeles. Yeah. Well, thanks for doing it. It was swell. It was I'd nice love to, meet to come you. back sometime too. This was fun. Okay. I'll have you back. How's Maybe. Ne how's next week? <laughs> Great. Sounds good. If I can find parking. Uh, okay. You got a, you got a tail slate here. This was Sarah Tomko and thanks for watching. <laughs> Okay, uh, I appreciate your honesty.